Well, uh, good afternoon, all of you, and welcome to this uh, critical thinking briefing, as we've called it, uh, by Friends of Europe, with me, uh, Jamie Shea, Senior Fellow at Friends of Europe, speaking to you today from uh, London. Now, those of you who follow our activities regularly will know that uh, at the end of every year, we organize an important meeting looking at the future of the Western Balkans. We call it our Balkans uh, Summit. Now, uh, at the moment, we've decided this year to take a somewhat different approach, which is to start the summit process early uh, in what we are calling a Balkans journey. And therefore, throughout 2021, to have a series of articles, a series of briefings, a series of conversations, looking at different aspects of the development of the Western Balkans, which will culminate, of course, with our major meeting, the summit, at the end of the year. Uh, too much of the debate on the Western Balkans has focused on the EU enlargement issue, uh, when and how. Now that of course is important for the future of the region, but we can't sit around and do nothing while we're waiting for the EU to open its doors and the six countries of the Western Balkans to be ready to enter. In the meantime, there's lots of practical things to improve the economic and social uh, situation of people in the region that we should be getting on with. And one of the most significant and important things in terms of the future economic and social development of the region is the economic empowerment of women. Uh, and that is the theme uh, of the conversation which I'm delighted uh, to moderate today. Um, we all know that any economic recovery, particularly one after this severe COVID-19 uh, pandemic, is going to be more difficult if the economic contribution of women uh, is, is held back and is not uh, fully ex uh, uh, exploited. Uh, and uh, the report and the roadmap that we're going to be discussing today, which is contributed jointly by the United Nations Development Programme and by the Regional Cooperation Council, has come up with the figure that uh, the overall uh, GDP growth of the region could be held back by as much as 20%, which is an enormous figure, uh, if women are not able to have an equal participation in the labor market as men uh, currently uh, have. Uh, the uh, roadmap points to the fact that only 27.5% of women uh, 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 of, uh, biz of business uh, owners uh, in, in the region uh, are women. Uh, only 14.2% of top managers in companies, that three times more women are doing unpaid work than men. Uh, and that as the COVID-19 crisis hits the region, like everywhere else, and people lose their jobs or work less or are forced into part-time work, uh, by far, uh, women are suffering from that uh, loss of job opportunity uh, than uh, 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 men. So this is uh, obviously an issue of social justice, uh, of course, of equal rights, of human rights, like it is anywhere else. But it's also uh, a very much question of the future economic growth and development uh, of the entire region and its ability to catch up uh, with the uh, rest of Europe and the rest of the world. And, and indeed, this uh, report and roadmap uh, also uh, suggests that uh, the Western Balkans are uh, specific unto themselves with particular obstacles, which we will discuss today. But unfortunately, the Western Balkans is also part of a global trend where uh, a lot has happened, of course, to empower women, but not enough. And one of the statistics that really caught my attention was that it would take 257 years, in other words, two and a half centuries more, if we carry on going at the present speed of uh, empowering women uh, in uh, uh, employment uh, to close the current gap with the men. That's a quite an awesome uh, uh, statistic. So today, in this critical thinking briefing, uh, we want to find out uh, why are women not participating more? What are the reasons? Are they social, political, economic, uh, cultural, educational? Uh, what policies uh, uh, do the governments of the Western Balkans need to adopt uh, to remove the barriers and the uh, obstacles? What roles can important international bodies like the UN Development Programme and the Regional Cooperation Council, the EU, region, other regional bodies play uh, in pushing uh, the empowerment of women uh, 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 forward? 
are there good examples as well as bad examples uh, that can be uh, followed? And where there are policies and incentives and financial packages and legislation, uh, are they working? Uh, what more needs to be done? Now, today, I'm absolutely delighted to, uh, for this conversation to welcome back to a Friends of Europe platform, uh, uh, two great friends uh, of uh, uh, our think tank who have uh, uh, performed many times in the past. Uh, they're uh, professional experts uh, doesn't need to be acclaimed by me. Uh, first of all, uh, Mijana Spoljarik Egger, uh, who is a, an Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, she is the Director of the Regional Bureau for Europe and the Commonwealth of Independent States of the UN Development Program. Mijana, welcome back uh, once more. Uh, and uh, Malinda Abregu, uh, who is the Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council. Uh, and uh, these two uh, eminent uh, opinion leaders uh, and eminent uh, role models uh, for women uh, have uh, jointly combined their expertise and their efforts and the efforts of their two important organizations uh, to produce uh, uh, the uh, roadmap on the empowerment of women in the Western Balkans, uh, which is the report with the recommendations that we are going to be discussing uh, today. So first of all, I want to stop talking and hand immediately over to the two experts to lead off our discussion. I've asked Majana to start off uh, and, and to give us a sense of what are the game changes that we should be looking at uh, if we're going to make progress with the empowerment of women and what some of the obstacles are and how easily uh, we can remove or not remove those obstacles. Uh, and thereafter, I'm going to ask Melinda to give us an overall view of the recommendations and the thrust of the report uh, and how she believes that uh, your two bodies can effectively, now that you've written such a good report, use it uh, to bring about the much needed change uh, and a greater focus uh, on this uh, important challenge that we face. So again, thank you so much. I'll have the opportunity to ask you, I hope, some relevant questions uh, in a little while. But first of all, Majana, over you to kick off our debate today. I give you the virtual space. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie, and good morning from New York. I'm also very pleased to be here with my Linda, my by now long-term partner on, on these issues. And it's it's always a great uh, you know, opportunity for me to, to, to share a conversation with my Linda and to talk about these important issues together. I um I want to start by saying, why do we talk about women economic empowerment? And, and this is where, where we came from. It's because it is an accelerator to sustainable development in the region, notably also in the Western Balkans. We cannot um, look at economic growth. We cannot look at social inclusion. We cannot look at tackling the key challenges in the region also coming out from COVID. If we don't look at the situation of women and how we can empower them in all aspects, because wherever we want to empower women, be it on the rights, on their political status and, and possibilities, be it on, on their economic uh, integration, we have to look at it in a systemic way and we, we have to always have the whole specter in front of us. But I want to start by, by talking about the specific issue where uh, actually Marlinda and I started the conversation from. It was about how do we empower women in areas that will define the future world of work. And this has become even more relevant as we are talking now about COVID recovery, green transition, and, and pushing further uh, towards productive and positive digital transformation in the region. Now, it all starts with negative stereotypes. Negative stereotypes have for thousands of years prevented women from harnessing their full potential, and they have prevented the world from harnessing half of the, potentially half of the world's potential on, on innovation capacity. So the intellectual capital that the world has is reduced by not integrating women, and this to the detriment of sustainable economic development in all countries. Now, the foundations for women in STEM science, technology, engineering, and math are laid very early in life, we will agree. But scientists are formed in universities. And then we have to form women leaders in tech companies. We have to form founders of tech companies in the future. So what we need is a comprehensive strategy that will build on encouragement and empowerment of women, 
by raising awareness from the early phases of, of women development or girl development, emphasize skill building, but also emphasize on entrepreneurship. Because we know today that science and technology are regarded as critical to national economies and that women working directly in STEM and tech related areas are directly contributing to economic innovation and productivity. Why is this important? And it's not only important to bring women into, into you know, relevant or, or to, to let women work directly in STEM areas. What we know today is that very soon, roughly 90 or even 100% of future jobs will require some degree of technical and digital skills. So if we don't start now and especially benefiting on the COVID recovery to proactively design strategies of including women into the labor market and the future world of work, we will have missed the train and left women behind unnecessarily. Now, what we have done now uh, together with the RCC and UNDP is design a comprehensive roadmap, part of which is focusing on integrating women in the future of labor markets, but part of it's also focusing on education, on legal empowerment and political empowerment of women. So I will let Melinda speak about this in more detail. Thank you. Uh, Majal, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I'm tempted to ask you why it is that if there are more women university graduates in the region than men, women are only represented, as you, your report says, to the level of 14% of jobs in STEM at the moment. But let's come back to that in the conversation. Um, Melinda, I, I, indeed, over to you now to give us a sense of maybe some of the other areas where women need to be empowered, uh, although STEM, of course, is so fundamental to the future economic growth, some of your other key recommendations, uh, and you there being based there in, in, in Tirana, directly in the region, a sense of maybe some of the obstacles which are preventing women uh, from uh, uh, not just getting more jobs, but also getting more leadership uh, jobs, because uh, your report also points out that uh, not only are women sort of globally underrepresented, but when it comes to, you know, the glass ceiling or getting up the ladder, uh, uh, even more problems are placed in their way. Uh, again, great to see you, and uh, I give the virtual floor to you. Thank you very much, and it's uh, great to see you too. So great to see you, uh, Mirjana, again. Uh, well, as uh, as you already know, so I I was just uh, and I still I, I it looks like I'm kind of bouncing up and down in the car because I was traveling to come from from uh, uh, Pristina while I was uh, in visit yesterday, and uh, definitely from Pristina there is a very good example. So now they have the second president. Uh, as a woman president in office, so the second time that they have a woman as, as president. And, uh, and I think that that's a very good message as well uh, uh, for uh, all of us uh, other economies in the region. Now, uh, back to our uh, joint endeavor uh, of, uh, of uh, Mirjana, her team, and, uh, and RCC and our team. First, I have to say to you that it looks like we are all uh, comfortable and it's quite familiar to speak about the women, the gender equality, the women economic empowerment, uh, and uh, all of us uh, can, our heads can be fully with, uh, with, full with ideas uh, and, uh, and uh, reading reports as well, or, uh, or uh, different findings. Uh, but the, the situation, it looks like, like the situation, it comes like, like natural that we, kick up, that we talk about this, these topics. But uh, in the reality, the situation is not really, really so, uh, so rosy. And uh, for uh, so many reasons. So uh, you mentioned uh, some of the ways how to, to get out from it and to improve it. Mirjana was mentioning as well some uh, of, uh, of the ground reasons from the uh, stereotypes still, uh, still present. But I have to say that stereotypes uh, and uh, let's say society and, uh, and uh, group uh, challenges are present uh, uh, every, everywhere in the world. In the Balkans, the situation becomes a bit more complicated uh, because uh, there are huge problems uh, in uh, trying to close the gender gap in the, in the labor market because of the structure of our economies uh, in, uh, in the region. There is a second reason why the situation is a bit more complicated because of the brain drain. A lot of young people, young women 
are uh, are living uh, uh, from uh, from the region uh, trying to find a better a better solution and and, and have a better life uh, somewhere else our market economies are are fragile so the governments have to start thinking and prioritize where their reforms should be should be placed and uh, we know that um, whenever uh, you have a limited budget and limited resources uh, then the tendencies are to focus uh, on those areas that are of utmost importance so you have to pick and choose and it happens that maybe the child care system uh, or uh, talking about uh, uh, women uh, how women uh, face and the problems persisting in in the business environment for them uh, it's not really quite quite an easy an easy call for for governments let alone then uh, changing the educational system. That is one of the things, and I think it comes as well as out of the recommendations from this, from this study. That is one of the things that if we'd really like to catch up the level uh, of uh, women uh, employment uh, uh, that as it is in the, in the European Union, uh, but uh, as well in a global, in a global trend. So uh, we need to immediately focus from yesterday, not today. The Western Balkan six gender unemployment gap is four times the EU average. Uh, and uh, I had to say that one of those areas of utmost importance is education. The system of education, especially the diplomas uh, in, in the Western Balkans during the last 10 years, even a bit more, but I'll just say 10 years, uh, where kind of, you know, there was kind of a gender differences in, in, uh, in the getting or studying uh, uh, in, in university. Women were, uh, especially lately due to the demographic uh, changes, but even to the democratic uh, uh, uprisings in, in, uh, in different economies in the region, were mostly focused and oriented in studying uh, diplomacy, international affairs, uh, let's say uh, social affairs, linguistics, which are pretty much welcome. But these created a difference. So these, the women and these diplomas, the diplomas they got from universities, oriented them mostly to the public administration. And uh, it created a lot of gap in the business sector. So you see day by day uh, that uh, uh, women entrepreneurs in the region are not so much. But even in terms of, um, of employment, men outnumber women in the region uh, labor force more than, uh, than one million. So uh, by considering that there are more than 42% of women in the Western Balkans unemployed, or some of them lost their job because they lack this, this digital skills that uh, we are so much interested as well to, to promote to, through the, the women and girls in STEM, or uh, through those targeted measures and programs, trainings, on, uh, on uh, upskilling the women who are out of the labor market. So I think uh, that all this, uh, these uh, elements might be really, really important to reverse and to change, uh, to change this uh, trend. But okay. two things for me, yeah. uh, what women need most, apart from the lectures that we can give all day and discuss thoroughly. Uh, I think women in the Western Balkans need first access to income. And access to incomes comes by respecting properly uh, their, uh, their uh, uh, not only their role, but uh, even by targeting their family relations. So access to income, access to, to property, which by culture is uh, uh, mostly uh, given to men. Uh, and women will need power and role models to make the right decisions. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be very much difficult to change the situation in uh, in the near future, and we aim to start immediately. Thank you very much. So, thank you, uh, Melinda, and, and the two of you. I mean, you bring up uh, an enormous number of issues, so let's try to get through as many as we can. Uh, Mijana, you mentioned, uh, of course, the importance of uh, STEM, uh, and uh, how do we begin to sort of get therefore more women involved in this sector with all of the skills and talent that they have? Is it something where you think the, the governments of the region have to take a lead and, I don't know, you know, improve the education systems to have more sort of technical training or at least uh, um, science and technology education as opposed to the international relations uh, courses that I studied and that uh, uh, Malinda uh, just uh, mentioned? Uh, is it uh, something 
where maybe the private sector, you know, in international multinational companies in the region could take a greater lead uh, in devising sort of corporate sort of programs or whatever. I mean, you know, as you look at all of the various policy levers to try to get this moving, uh, where do you think the, the emphasis should be? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Jamie. Let me um, let me go back to, to two things that Malinda mentioned, which I, I think is are extremely important. One was the brain drain um, coming out of the region, the depopulation that we've been observing over the last two decades, um, you know, especially the young and the educated also leaving the, the countries in the region. That has to be tackled. Um, and, and, and this is directly related to women uh, economic empowerment. And then another thing that Marilinda said, um, women will be equal if they have equal control over assets. Mm. That's a fact. You know, you can, you can look at legal empowerment, you can look at political empowerment, you can elect them into national parliaments if they don't control the assets, if they don't control the firms and the companies equally as men, they will not be equally influential and powerful. Now, why do we need women in the market? It's because the, the region is lacking human capital and, and, and labor force in, in this future world of work, to say that term again. So where, where are the opportunities in a region like the Western Balkans for the governments to promote sustainable and inclusive growth? It is green economy. It is um, in, the, in, the, in the technological work, in the digital uh, work and, and in, the, in the services field because it's not a resource rich region and, and it's highly dependent on tourism. Otherwise, it's dependent on the human capital that needs to be promoted and half of that human capital are women. Now, um, the private sector, what does the private sector do in all this? The private sector can providing that the governments lay out the right policies and frameworks for them, the private sector can drive sci scientific and technological advancement and innovation. But the private sector can potentially become the biggest partner and the key partner in promoting women equality by hiring women, by offering women skills on the job program, by promoting women, by by ensuring that there, you know, there is a gender friendly work environment, you know, by, by introducing sexual harassment policies, by, by introducing flexible work arrangements, by making sure that they pay women and men equally, and that when they have a choice between men and women, they also consider women applications. All this can be driven by the private sector. The private sector is a key stakeholder when it comes to public decisions. So we have to ensure this systemic approach that links the private sector needs, the future of the labor market with the public policies, both gender specific and economic specific. I can come back to that, but we, we need both. We have to promote economic growth and then within that, figure out what are the key policies that we need to promote the women in that context. Thanks a lot. And, and Melinda, just uh, building on this and coming to you, uh, 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 Mijana mentioned the, the, the importance of the private sector. But do you have in the Western Balkans also things, obviously trade unions like we've been used to them uh, in Europe, you know, professional associations, civic society kind of movements, which you know, as a counterpart to the private sector could also be bringing up uh, the importance, you know, equal pay, equal opportunities, uh, uh, equal uh, promotion opportunities. Um, so, you know, apart from you know, private sector executives, uh, are there those other sort of parts of the what you know we call in Europe the social partners who are present and active who can operate from their end? And and the second question is, if I may, you, you mentioned and that, for me that was a key insight of the uh, uh, of the roadmap, uh, the importance of uh, having sort of modern legislation which allows uh, women to have ownership of their uh, assets. Um, are there good examples? Uh, 
uh, among the Western Balkan countries of, uh, of countries that are actually adapting this legislation. It's always useful for us, I think, in these debates to get a sense of, you know, who's doing it well and who's doing it badly and how we can maybe, you know, get the, the good ones to teach their uh, lessons to the not so good ones. So, you know, uh, so those would be my two points to you. Uh, you know, apart from the private sector, who else out there uh, should be pushing this more? Uh, and uh, are there sort of uh, not just good female role models, women role models, but also good sort of uh, nation government role models uh, that we could uh, point to and say, you're, you're doing the right thing, others should follow your example? Um, I have to say that there is not a lot of difference uh, uh, in uh, these terms, who is pushing a lot on uh, trying to close this gap and, uh, and having solid narratives. Uh, that uh, uh, the economy and our economic growth and the, and, and the change and the shift will uh, as well uh, come from having more women and they are the key to the development uh, of our country. So more women in the labor market. Uh, but, and, and I think those, those usual suspects are, are the same. So trade unions uh, are in somewhere still, still uh, existent, uh, but uh, you should know that because of our culture, uh, like it is, for example, in Albania, but not only, where uh, trade unions were so, so famous and infamous as well, following the party line during communism, uh, then uh, when the system uh, changed, trade unions were not so much welcomed or, or active. But women at work, uh, networks are quite quite uh, active as well. The chambers of uh, of commerce as well. So women networks in business are uh, quite uh, quite active everywhere in uh, in the region. Uh, yes, we have to to help them build up and bridge their relationships with with each other. But uh, definitely, they are quite quite influencing. I have to say that in all the Western Balkans, six uh, uh, the budgetary process and the formulation is uh, at least uh, since uh, uh, six years uh, seen and uh, designed under the lenses of, uh, of gender uh, perspective. So all the trends that are, uh, that are present uh, everywhere in the world are present in the Balkans as well. Now you'd say, okay, so you are fine. So what are you looking for? If we have the same trends, then the, it's done. We are speaking of trends and we are speaking of realities and possibilities, as I mentioned to you. By being not rich countries, by having uh, and uh, six separate markets, and that's what we are trying to do from, from RCC, trying to, to uh, build up one market, one market for all the six countries of the Western Balkan Six. We are trying to make the diplomas and professional qualifications recognized. Uh, unemployment is high everywhere in the region. But we are trying to give a chance uh, uh, to women and men, but now we are, we are talking on women, uh, to have their, their recognition of their profession ready. So if they don't find a job in Tirana, they can go and find a job in, in, uh, in uh, Podgorica. Or if uh, one does not have a job in Podgorica, to go and work in Belgrade. The COVID-19 brought, brought uh, up new, new perspectives as well, since the sectors most hit it in the region are the service ones, like tourism. And uh, in the Western Balkan Six, more than 93% of the business uh, community and the business tissue is uh, composed and it's are the small and medium enterprises heading. Uh, and women who are mostly working in this sector, so restaurants, uh, 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 tourism, as I mentioned, services. So these as well brought up some, some uh, uh, a new situation in the region. And there, that's, that's I said, so uh, governments should, should think, uh, think twice. Because first, if we have less vocational training and uh, more diplomas than jobs, it will mean that we'll have more people unemployed. If we'll have more women just trying to get a diploma and young girls, just to get, to get a job and, uh, and get a salary in the public administration, it means that the competitiveness uh, of women is like, I yeah. won't say killed, but it's like, you know, slipping. Yeah. If we don't uh, uh, start... Uh, uh, just pushing and promoting as well, but talking yeah. even to the business community, to men who still prefer yeah. to, to get a man as an employer than women. They know that women are, are uh, good performers, 
but in terms of enterprises yeah. and then their business, they would like those to be run by by uh, by men. So these are all all areas that we need to focus our. Uh, our well, it's a question attention. of getting a lot of different policy aspects right coming together, and I appreciate what you also said about you know, sort of integrating the internal market. So there's greater mobility as well uh, uh, for for women. Uh, we've almost run out of time. It, uh, this half an hour has gone so quickly. So I've only got time to ask each of you a, a sort of a final question. And uh, Mijana, obviously uh, you operating at the global international level uh, and focusing on Europe overall, uh, how do you see the role of the EU or of you know, international organizations in exerting leverage over the countries of the Western Balkans? For example, should they, or are they linking the empowerment of women's programs to the granting of aid or uh, to um, uh, other forms of techn technical cooperation. I was using linkage, using leverage. Uh, and uh, Melinda, final question to you, and I have to ask both of you to be brief. I, I regret this because so much more to say, but the time has gone so quickly. So my last question to you is you've, you've both of you have produced a, a fascinating report. It's packed with lots of ideas uh, 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 for, for driving uh, change. Uh, but how now that you've written the report and produced it, how do you are you going to sort of use it and instrumentalize it uh, to uh, at least uh, bring about the implementation of some of those uh, recommendations? So two final brief questions, and then I'm afraid we have uh, hit the buffers uh, when it comes to the clock uh, and we'll need to close. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, am I to start? Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, now, let me... Let me say, by endorsing the Common Regional Market Action Plan, the Western Balkans leaders, and, and Melinda and I were aware of that, already endorsed the importance of addressing the socioeconomic uh, situation of women in the region. Now, the, the Western Balkans Women Economic Empowerment Roadmap that both our organizations developed are meant to accompany um, this, this, this political decision with a set of options and possible strategies for the governments to look to and for our international par partners to work in with us to drive that decision and to, to make it reality in the region. And the EU here plays an extremely important part because the EU can increase its demand on the governments for alignment with progressive policies, including their own um, you know, EU policies in this regard. Um, which will drive sustainable development in the region uh, into the right direction and where we want to see it, including women 100% and fully. Now, we as UNDP, as I said before, are looking at two levels of policies. And it is about policies and the right frameworks and the right strategies and political commitment more than it is about money and development aid at this stage, especially in a middle income context as we are operating in, in the Western Balkans. Governments have to continue promoting economic growth per se, because you know, creating jobs means more jobs for women. They have to invest in public services, in public infrastructure, investing in reliable access to internet, investing in public transportation will benefit women who want to go to work. The governments have to promote innovation and technology because that's the value add to their economies and that's where economic growth will be stimulated. Now, in order to um, promote women in all these fields, governments have to look to social protection systems and make them gender friendly. They'd have to review their tax regimes and their development plans. What they, what they also have to do, and th these are triggers probably to accelerating women inclusion, is formalize care economy, share care between men and women, formalize jobs in areas where predominantly women work. So reduce the level of informal work and social in insecurity because it's mostly women now affected by, by the loss of jobs in these areas and provide healthcare systems. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you uh, so, sorry. came out with a lot of- Sorry, Jenny, I said healthcare. Of course, healthcare is important. I meant childcare. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, the, the two go together, of course, as well. Um, 
Uh, John, thanks very much. So, Melinda, you have the final word, and I have to ask you to be succinct, but uh, you've got, as I said, a great report, but uh, like a symphony, it's great to write it, but it's even more important to play it and to perform it. So how are you going to perform your report uh, on the people who need to take the necessary action, both internationally and in the region? Well, first and foremost, we need to join uh, forces, uh, not only uh, Mirjana, myself and, and our teams, but uh, everybody. So uh, Friends of Europe as well is, is uh, welcomed and, and invited to help us in this, in this endeavor. Not in writing another good report. Uh, we are pretty much aware that things are easier said than done, in, uh, especially in this region. But uh, trying to, to build up and continue as, uh, as we have promised and planned with the right indicators encouraging women to, to pursue entrepreneurship careers, uh, start uh, uh, getting a degree in, uh, in STEM, where the future is, to incre increase uh, uh, their participation in the digital uh, upskilling, and definitely working to establish women entrepreneurs network and women-led innovative teams. On top of that, by promoting the role of successful women in uh, in the region, RCC has been, uh, uh, I have to say, proudly quite quite successful in uh, in that. So we started two years ago in promoting uh, women that even for for us, for ourselves, uh, were such uh, success stories that we are not aware of. And uh, I think this is a very good example and a good message that that we send to our partners. For some of our partners, be those member state countries or yeah. not only, Western Balkans looks like a remote area where everything goes wrong, but there are good examples that have to be promoted. Thank you. Uh, 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 and thanks, uh, Mariana, Melinda. Thank you to the two of you. Uh, in a short space of time, you packed in an enormous number of good uh, ideas, sensible uh, uh, proposals, all wrapped up in a real strategy. You, I think, would have convinced everybody who's followed uh, mm -hmm. our conversation today that this and is... And we'll continue only, to pitch for, for that. <laughs> we will. It's not only a question of fairness uh, to women, but it's also a question of common sense. You pointed convincingly to the massive sort of disadvantage of not empowering women. Uh, everybody loses, not just women, uh, but also the massive advantages of uh, uh, tapping uh, this potential, which is important uh, for the Western Balkans, uh, like everywhere else in the world. And, and you, you know, you've given policymakers an enormous menu of things. Maybe they can't do everything at once, but they certainly have no excuse for not doing at least many of the things that you suggest. There's low hanging fruit, they're quick deliverables, as well as the more long term structural changes that you uh, point to. And you said it's all about good policies. It's all about resources. Um, but above all, it's a question of political will. So I, again, I'd like to thank the two of you for uh, really enlightening us today. Uh, you'll obviously come back and Friends of Europe is committed to helping you uh, on this journey. Uh, to everybody who's also uh, listened to watch today, thank you again for joining us. Do what you can also in your own fields to push this agenda uh, forward. And please, uh, just like uh, Mirana and Melinda, uh, report back to us on what you find and what you encounter and your own ideas for how we can take this agenda forward. But from uh, myself, Jamie Shea, on behalf of Friends of Europe, thanks to the team uh, for organising today's uh, critical thinking dialogue and see you soon uh, on this virtual platform. Bye for now.